I'd like to talk to you today about optimism. But I'd like to start with this. This is Earthrise, the first photograph ever taken of Earth from space by mankind. It was taken by astronaut William Anders on Christmas Eve 1968. It's been described as the most important environmental photograph ever taken. Not because of what it shows down here, but because it shows our place out there. It's been 47 years since that photograph was taken. And in those 47 years, we know that we've lost more than half of the world's wildlife. 90% of large fish in the world's oceans have disappeared. We've listed more than 21,000 species as critically endangered and more than 800 as extinct. These aren't trivial species. A species like the Chinese river dolphin, the western black rhino, the Formosan leopard, two subspecies of tiger, more than 50 species of birds, and many that we probably don't even know about. These are the nuts and bolts of our ecosystems, and we're degrading them. When I was a boy growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut, because I thought if we could go into space and we could set foot on the moon, then we can do anything. But it seems like here on Earth, we can't. It seems like conservation, it's even harder than rocket science. Now, before I came on, I drew a picture of the world as I see it. As you can probably tell, I'm not an artist. In fact, I'm a conservation biologist. And because of the training you get to be a scientist, you're always told to see the world in a certain way, and of course, to label your axes. But what I can say is that this is how I see the world. And what this can, can show you that Earthrise can't is our point in time. And this point in time, more than any other, I think is characterised by biodiversity loss. As we've developed, as we've industrialised, as populations have grown, so too have we lost biodiversity. And as we started at the top, I see us now balanced precariously on a downward slope of biodiversity loss. And at the bottom lies a Pandora's box of problems. But I'm optimistic, because never before has there been a generation where we're on the verge, we're on the verge of being in a place where every single person on Earth has the potential to influence the outcome of our path. I'm excited because never before has there been a generation that in their lifetimes, in your lifetimes, in my lifetime, we'll see biodiversity loss slow, stop, and eventually return. It can happen. And in fact, it has to happen in your lifetimes. Because if it doesn't, it'll be too late. And so if you're someone that's passionate about the environment, that cares about conservation, that cares about the world, then it's a very exciting time to be alive. And over the next 12 or so minutes, I want to share with you three stories that I hope will persuade you too to be optimistic for conservation. The first story I want to tell you about is about an island. It's about an island that's rich in biodiversity, but incredibly threatened too. The story is about how great things have to have small beginnings. The place I'm talking about is Madagascar. Madagascar was my first expedition, although I didn't know that at the time. In fact, before I went to Madagascar, I knew very little about it. Bear in mind, the film had only just come out, so neither did anybody else. And I'd love to say there was a deep and meaningful reason to go on a first expedition to Madagascar, but after giving up on the astronaut idea that I told you about, I have to say, as a teenager, my priorities were just to do something in the hope of impressing girls. And so before I could realise it, I was camped in the rainforest, in the heart of the rainforest in Madagascar. Now, when you're camping in a place like this, it's very easy to forget. You're in the heart of the rainforest, but you're on an island within an island. Because surrounding these fragments of pristine rainforest in Madagascar are miles 
and miles of barren grassland where the rainforest has been cleared, slashed and burned, agriculture, and now nothing. This is land that has been used up. This is land that is now worthless. That is the state of Madagascar. In places, you can see where the forest abruptly ends. But we were there as optimists. We were there to try and help. And to do that, you need to plant trees. This is the state in the art of conservation in Madagascar. We were there as a small team from the UK supporting something called the TAMS project. Now TAMS stands for a word in Malagasy that's about this long that I can't possibly hope to say, but it roughly translates as bringing the forest back to life. And that's exactly what we were trying to do. And so we would spend our time ferrying these little seedlings high up onto these hillsides where you can see the abrupt end of these forest islands, digging holes, turning the soil over, placing these seedlings and slowly bedding them down. It was back-breaking work. And after about three or four weeks of work, our little team, I'm proud to say, managed to plant 464 trees. Now, that's the point where an applause would be lovely, but, but you're absolutely right. 464 trees. A country the size of Madagascar. Think of just one hectare of rainforest, how many trees are in that. 464 trees, it's not enough, is it? It's a drop in the ocean. So if this is a talk about optimism, where am I going with this story? Well, there's one crucial thing that I've forgotten to tell you. And that's what we looked like when we turned up. I want you to imagine that we arrived in this village in the back of a little minibus, and out we stepped, and we had our, our great big boots from Cotswold. We had our waterproof trousers, our walking poles, our 80-litre rucksacks, our sun hats, bright luminescent waterproof jackets. We looked absolutely ridiculous, even more so when we started picking up these little seedlings, putting them in these crates and ferrying them up the hillsides. We caused quite a stir, we made a bit of a fashion statement. And so everyone from the surrounding area, all the local villages came to see what on earth these crazy people were doing. And that gave us the opportunity to talk about reforestation. We could talk about conservation, we could talk about planting trees. And when they said, but in your country, how much forest do you have? We could say, it's nothing like yours. We could, we could show them how valuable their forest was. And without even realising it, we made tree planting cool. We put it on the map. Now, the funny thing about conservation is sometimes when you leave and you finish the project, you don't ever get to find out what happened. And it wasn't until four years later that I happened to be talking to someone who'd been part of a film crew that had been filming in this area who could tell me about, about the situation out there. And he said that in the four years since our little tiny team had been there and planted 464 trees, more than a million trees had been planted. Now, we can't take the credit for that, but what I hope we did do is play a small, tiny part in getting the ball rolling. Those trees have been planted by that fantastic, inspired, engaged communities in the local area. And one day, we can really hope that the rest of Madagascar looks like this again. But really, the moral of the story is that great things have to have small beginnings. The second story I want to talk to you about is about small things and species coming back from the edge. How often do you hear conservation success stories? Very, very rarely. But they're out there. They're happening all the time. And that's an important thing to remember. And in the next five minutes, I want to just introduce you to some of the who's who of conservation success stories. These species here, up there, that's the Mauritius kestrel. There were only four of those left in the world in the 1970s. Now, there's more than 200. The Espanolan giant tortoise lives on an island in the Galapagos. In the 1970s, there were just 15 left, and conservationists brought them into the Charles Darwin Research Centre, and, and after a captive breeding program, there are now more than 800. In fact, at the time, those 15 were made up of just 12 females and just three males. All I can say is that the 70s were a great time to be a male Espanola and giant tortoise. <laughs> In the 80s, there were just 18 American black-footed mink, now more than 2,000. There were just five Chatham Islands black robins, and just one of those was a mature, fertile female 
called Old Blue. Thanks to her and thanks to conservationists, there are now more than 200. And of course, I couldn't give this story without talking about the American Californian condor. In 1987, there were just 22 left in the world. Conservationists took the drastic step of catching them from the wild and taking them to, into a captive breeding program, so that at that point, North America's largest land bird became extinct in the wild. But thanks to conservationists who decided to do something instead of nothing, four years later, they could start reintroducing them, and there are now more than 400. All of those things happened since Earthrise was taken. For the biggest success story, we have to go back to 1885, the southern white rhino. Now, the southern white rhino, we thought it was extinct. We thought we'd wiped it out until a tiny population of 50 animals was discovered in a remote part of South Africa. Now, thanks to conservationists, this is the most common, sub this is the most common species of rhino anywhere in the world. There are more than 21,000 of them. So successes can happen but none of those are the best story. The best story is the Lord Howe Island stick insect. The Lord Howe Island stick insect lives here, Lord Howe Island, a tiny island off Australia. At least it did until the 1930s when a British ship shipwrecked or uh, ran aground on the island and black rats accidentally escaped. What followed was a wave of extinctions. Endemic birds, endemic insects, all went extinct, including the Lord Howe Island stick insect. And that's the way it stayed for 80 years. This species was listed as extinct, lost to the world. That was until scientists in 2001 decided to climb Ball's Pyramid. Ball's Pyramid is a 560-meter volcanic stack, 20 kilometers off the coast of Lord Howe Island. And on that mountain, halfway up, they found a single bush. And underneath that single bush was a population of 24 surviving Lord Howe Island stick insects. The last of their kind in the world, the rarest insect on Earth. They brought two pairs back to Australia, they bred them. Now there are thousands. I expect you're wondering, exactly what the Lord Howe Island stick insect looks like. There we go. Not particularly attractive, not particularly inspiring, but this is important because this goes to show that you don't have to be cute and cuddly for humanity to want to save you. If we can save this thing, its other name is the tree lobster, if we can save the Lord Howe Island stick insect, we can save anything. And there's a reason that in 2015 all these species are still here. And it's because someone somewhere decided to do something instead of nothing. Maybe their actions galvanised a group of people, maybe it brought public attention, maybe it did something else. But it had to start somewhere, and it had to start with someone. And that's something that we're all capable of. The last story I want to share with you is about the people themselves. And it's a very short, a very simple story. And my point boils down to this. You don't have to be a conservationist to do conservation. If you're a lawyer, then help support indigenous people's land rights. Indigenous people make fantastic stewards for the land. If you're a physicist or a chemist, then help us develop better plastics, better energy sources. If you're a businessman, then help us work out how to value ecosystem services. We need to know how to value those. If you're a teacher, you probably have a job more important than any other, and that's to help us bring education to parts of the world that don't have it, help us learn how to value our wildlife. If you want to campaign, the divestment and the rewilding movements would both love your support. We need absolutely everyone in Conservationist, but you don't have to be a conservationist. This, I think, illustrates my point more than anything. We need people like Antonio. Antonio, a few years ago on an expedition in the Peruvian Amazon, was one of our guides. He was in charge of the boats. He helped us conduct all our surveys. He was absolutely indispensable, and his knowledge of the forest was second to none. 
And one evening around a campfire, he told me about his past more than 15 years ago. He told me how in the dead of the night he could creep through the forest and track Jaguar. He could be gone from home for days, maybe a week at a time. He could get within metres of a Jaguar and then he could shoot it dead. Because Antonio was a poacher. Antonio shot Jaguar. A Jaguar very nearly killed him. And with a skin, he could take it to the market, he could sell it, and he could provide for his local family. How did he know that there'd been decades of deforestation in the Amazon? He was just doing what he had to do to survive. But now, with conservationists in the area, he's able to do something different. He's able to help support conservation. And we are so lucky to have him. And the moral of this story is that we think that we know the people that oppose conservation. We think we know as conservationists who we shouldn't like. Poachers is fairly high up that list. But we're wrong. We have to have an open mind. Often it's the people that we least expect that can bring something so useful and so valuable to the discussion. So I've told you three stories. I've told you how great things have to have small beginnings. I've told you about how species can go right to the edge, but they can come back. We have to be willing to do something rather than nothing and not be afraid to fail. And I've told you how in conservation we have to have an open mind. Sometimes it's the people you least expect that have something important to say. And so to finish off by looking at that Earthrise picture, I think I would say this. Before Earthrise, maybe we lacked the perspective that we needed to understand the course we were taking. But now with that picture comes responsibility. It comes a sense of perspective. We're the ones in control, ultimately. We're the ones in control of the direction that we're traveling, and we have the power to change it. When I look around at my peers, conservationists, young people working around the world, supporting a variety of conservation projects. When I remember that they're the ones in their generation, in your generation, that have to make the difference, and when I remember it has to be them, and it can't be later, then I have to say, I'm optimistic. Thank you very much.